The following interview was conducted with um, Craig Swenson, Dean, College of Pharmacy, Nursing, and Health Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, September the 9th, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. I was born outside Baltimore, Maryland, on actually the 46th birthday of Ronald Reagan, which was February 6, 1957. And I grew up in Ellicott City, which is in the central part of Maryland. My parents were both first-generation Americans. I was the middle of five children. I have an older brother and older sister and two younger brothers. Okay. What was early years in school? Where did you go to school? And then talk a little bit about high school. Sure. I went to public school uh, throughout my timing uh, in school. I went to an elementary school that was in walking distance. We just had to cross a creek and walk through the woods and uh, enjoyed that time as I was growing up. And then I went to Mount Hebron High School, which was also in Ellicott City. I actually graduated early from high school. I really didn't care for school much and wanted to get out of there as quickly as I could. So I graduated actually after 11 years, completed okay. my high school. Were there any student activities that uh, you participated in while you were in school? Football was my major activity that I what played for a number did you of play? years. I was the safety and also ran back uh, kicks, both okay. punts. How did the team do? Not too bad? Or? We actually, uh, my last year that I played, we were undefeated and were conference champions, so we did pretty well. Very good. Well, Joe Till should keep that in mind, right? <laughs> I don't think I could help him at all. <laughs> oh, then let's talk a little bit about college, where you went and, and campus life and professors, et cetera. Sure. Well, you know, when I got out of high school, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I never wanted to go to college. Probably something you shouldn't say, right? Um, it's okay. And I didn't know uh, really what to do, and I got a job in a pharmacy. And uh, while I was working in the pharmacy as a clerk, the uh, one of the owners and his wife didn't have children but they they took kids under their wings a lot and he started mentoring me and uh, started training me to be uh, a pharmacy technician but that was back in the days where there wasn't really such a thing as pharmacy technicians and uh, he encouraged me to consider pharmacy so I asked him well how long did it take to train to do that he said well five years I said no it's not that interesting but over time I decided yes that's what I wanted to do so I uh, went to the University of Maryland, did my pre-pharmacy undergraduate work, and then entered into the bachelor's degree program in pharmacy, which at that time was a five-year program at the University of Maryland. I then went on and got my doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Maryland. At, at that point in time, I knew I wanted an academic career and was looking around for uh, what would be the next best step for training and had considered just doing a postdoctoral fellowship but decided instead to go on and uh, get my PhD, which I did at the University of Buffalo in a, a specialty area in pharmacology called pharmacokinetics. And then after that, I did a postdoctoral fellowship and then I uh, joined Wayne State University in Metro Detroit in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences for my first faculty position. Okay, tell us a little bit about that and what was the, were you doing some teaching there and research? And sure, I was, com I, as a standard faculty member, I was teaching uh, in the pharmacy program. I also taught a little bit in the nurse anesthesia program and the physician assistants and the physical therapy program and then also conducted research. My research area really focused on uh, unusual drug reactions, particularly skin rashes that people get. And uh, when the AIDS epidemic came along, we were particularly interested in trying to explain why patients that have AIDS have a much higher rate of adverse drug reactions. And so we began doing studies uh, looking at pharmacogenetics in, those, in that patient population and trying to understand what made them at greater risk for these unusual reactions. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is what my the career path before you came to Purdue, so you went to Wayne State first, mm -hmm. and then uh, what was next? Well, I joined Wayne State University as an assistant professor, rose through the ranks there to professor and associate chair of the department, and then I was asked to look at a position to head a department at the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy. Uh, so we joined there in 2003, and then in 2006 I got a call and asked if I would think about potentially looking at the position here as dean at Purdue. And so we, we thought about it, prayed about it, and said, yeah, it's, you know, this is an, an opportunity that's going to come very often in our career. Uh, I wasn't looking to make a move at the time, but we decided, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take a listen and take a look, and uh, here I am. Oh. What, do, what about family? Do you have, uh, were you married when you were, after, after you got out of graduate school? Sure. Or? I was married, actually, while I was finishing my graduate program. We have okay. three children. Our children now are kind of spread out in the Midwest. Uh, we have our older son is in Michigan with his family and three children. And then our daughter and her husband live in Ohio. 
and then our youngest son lives in Iowa City. Okay, okay. What was the campus like when you, when, did you come for an interview first off and then had a chance to look around the campus when, uh, when you were looking into the position? Yes, I had had an opportunity to come to Purdue uh, two times previous to that. I was just invited to give a seminar. In fact, uh, it was probably back in the, maybe the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when Dane Kildzik, who was uh, chair of one of the departments in pharmacy at that time, invited me and was trying to recruit me to a faculty position here at that time, and it just wasn't a right fit. So sure. I'd seen a little bit of the campus there then and then certainly during visits during the interview process for Dean. Yeah, that's good. Let's talk a little bit about um, the, you, the, you're the, the College of Pharmacy, Nursing, and Health Sciences, the strategic plan and the synergy between the three departments. Mm -hmm. Share a little bit of information with the researchers on that. Sure, well right now each of the schools is developing its own strategic plan that's focused in its areas of need and opportunities. And then the next step for us is to really look at how we can do things in a more interdisciplinary fashion. In, in two particular areas, one in terms of interdisciplinary education and secondly in terms of interdisciplinary research. And there's a lot of synergy there. In the College of Pharmacy, Nursing, and Health Sciences, we, we certainly are the primary unit on campus that has a, a focus on human health in both our right. discovery on our learning mission as well as in our engagement mission. There's a, a natural link that exists certainly between nursing and pharmacy. They interact a lot, particularly in institutional settings. Currently there is some teaching that goes on. We, for example, provide the pharmacology training that takes place in the nursing program. We have also in uh, pharmacy some of our students take one of the nursing courses. And we want to look for opportunities though to increase that interaction to be able to have a, a more integrated education so that these important health professionals are used to working with one another before they leave Purdue. All right. And uh, Reagan Street uh, has had so, somewhat of an impact on that. Sure. The Reagan Street Center for Healthcare yeah. Engineering certainly provides a, a great opportunity for interdisciplinary interactions in order to be able to look at our healthcare system and identify ways of improving the delivery of healthcare. And we have faculty in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences as well as the School of Nursing that participate in a number of the programs that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a center within the Reagan Street Center uh, that's a center for health, health outcomes. And that is actually directed by, uh, co-directed by a pharmacy faculty member and a nursing faculty member. Tell us a little for the researchers, what does that center, what's the focus of that particular center? The opportunity is to try to understand what really determines the outcomes that patients experience with various health interventions. Uh, one of the very important things that's taking place in healthcare right now is trying to be more careful in assessing whether or not the interventions that we undertake are really changing outcomes for patients. Are, are they getting better? Uh, do, do they function better in their normal day-to-day -day life? Are there fewer hospitalizations? Are there fewer visits for medical care? And, and the intent here is to try to evaluate that in fairly large populations, to try to identify those interventions that are most effective to be able to improve patient outcomes. Yeah, I see, that's okay. And then uh, you've got some cross-disciplinary type research. I think you addressed a little bit mm -hmm. of that. Tell us a little bit about um, how do you get the three units in working together? Elaborate a little bit on that. Well, I yeah. think when you have groups right. that are interested in problems with human health, and particularly interested in answering big questions, uh, it's very natural that they would come together. We have, for example, faculty in nursing and pharmacy that are working together on a project in Alzheimer's patients and trying to identify uh, factors that can improve the care. We have uh, faculty in nursing and pharmacy that are working together in how to best manage patients that have heart disease, particularly to the level where they now have heart failure, their heart is not pumping appropriately. Also a health literacy project. We also have faculty in health sciences and pharmacy that are interacting with one another in, in evaluating the toxicity of compounds and in trying to develop new radiopharmaceuticals that are so important for many of the diagnostic right. procedures. So we have within the college a lot of interaction, but in addition to that, our faculty reach well beyond the college, and we even have a number of joint appointments with, with the Department of Chemistry, with engineering, where we have significant interactions in key research initiatives. Right, and that works with the students and, as well. Oh, most certainly. It's right. very important to have students engaged, and particularly graduate students, getting used to interacting at interdisciplinary teams. Certainly when you look at the industry today, uh, most of the work that is being done is being done in an interdisciplinary context. Right, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about the students, the, um, uh, their enrollment and career goals, et cetera, and also that pharmacy uh, pra practice. Well, we, have, we, we train um, in students for three primary areas. 
uh, one is students who will actually come out and be healthcare professionals that will deliver right. health care. Okay. We have individuals who will work to assure a healthy work environment, and then we have individuals who are being trained as scientists that will identify the mechanisms of disease and develop new therapies and evaluate how we can best use those therapies. A key component is we have two very significant sized professional programs where we train healthcare practitioners. In the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, of course, we train people to be pharmacists, which is our Doctor of Pharmacy sure. program. Okay. It's a very competitive program right now. For example, this year we've got about 1,200 applications for 160 slots. Wow. So uh, there's a lot of competition. We have outstanding students that are entering into that program. In our uh, School of Nursing, we have the entry-level nursing program at the baccalaureate level. And we have about 150 students that enter that each year. We also have advanced training for nurses at the master's level and the doctor of nursing practice level. And combined, those make up about 50 uh, students. In the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, we also have a very strong emphasis on graduate education. We have the second largest graduate program in the pharmaceutical sciences in the United States. And we train them in all three of the departments in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences are training individuals at the master's and PhD level. Right. We also have a program where we train individuals for entry level positions in the sciences in mostly pharmaceutical industry. And that would be our bachelor's in pharmaceutical sciences program. And then our health sciences school prepares people in a variety of different areas related to health sciences. We train people in medical physics, so people who work in imaging, uh, such as MRIs and PET scans. We also train individuals for radiation safety, and they can work in industry, they can work in hospitals, they can work in, uh, in academia to make sure that radioactive substances are used safely. We train medical technologists who are responsible for many of the diagnostic tests, particularly the chemical and biological sure. tests that are done uh, when individuals are undergoing evaluation for diagnosis for various diseases. And we train people who focus in the area of occupational and environmental health, both at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level. Yeah. Do they go into therapy? Does that include, include therapy as well in the occupational? The, we don't train people okay. called uh, what you think of typically as occupational therapists sure. who okay. go in and help you pick how you do it. This is more focused on the issue of workplace safety. Oh, okay. So these okay. are scientists as opposed to health professionals right. okay. in our occupational environmental right. health. Um, that precision uh, specialty solutions, that, that you've got that, uh, that to work with an, uh, pa a diverse pa pa population that uh, is one of the areas I oh, think. Oh, you mean the, the specialty pharmaceuticals right. uh, that move down in by the airport? Right, that may be. Yeah, o over in the time that I've been here, we, we have assisted in recruiting three companies into Indiana that have pharmaceutical services as their core competency. One of those is Specialty RX, which is located at the airport. They took over the old United Airlines facility. This is good for researchers to know. Well, it's yeah. particularly helpful, I think, to recognize the opportunities it provides for students. Specialty RX focuses on um, what the name says, specialty pharmaceuticals. People, for example, have multiple sclerosis and need specialty drugs. People who have cancer and are being treated as outpatients and need specialty drugs. So they require a higher level of intervention than normal. So there are pharmacists and nurses who work there helping to manage patients as well as helping to make sure proper preparation for the medication. Then in addition, uh, we've been able to, as a state, recruit Medco here, which is the largest mail order uh, pharmacy provider and is also a large pharmacy benefit manager. They're the people who are work behind the scenes that evaluate and manage prescription medications and um, particularly for insurance plans. And they will be hiring uh, over 3,000 people into their facility here. And then the third company is uh, Arcadia Healthcare. Arcadia Healthcare has a variety of services, including long-term care facilities, and also a very innovative uh, way of providing medication um, through a, a system that allows you to group the medication that's needed at any given time in the day. And, and the way that this works, they call it daily med, is for every time that you need a medication, you can pull out a little cellophane strip and if you have four different medications you need to take at six o'clock in the morning on Monday, they're all in that little cellophane strip. And then the next strip is whatever your next dose is supposed to be. So it helps people who are on multiple drug therapy to remember what they're supposed to take and when. And also it's a good reminder. So if someone, for example, is uh, providing care for them and wants to know, well, did they take their 12 o'clock medication, 
they can just simply look and see if it's there or not. Um, and very they will helpful. <laughs> oh yes, and that's actually one of our alumnus that has developed that. Uh, Marv Richardson, who is an alum of our School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, has developed that and is now serving as president and CEO of the company. And so these are three companies that provide some good opportunities uh, for our students in the area of pharmacy, in the right. area of nursing. But it also provides us with some opportunity to interact as researchers in evaluating health outcomes. And we are actually initiating a program with Arcadia to evaluate their novel method of drug distribution to look at how that impacts patient outcomes. And we're working together with Arcadia and the state of Indiana. Oh, that sounds very good. Very, very nice. Um, you have some a liaison with the IU School of Medicine. You tell us you we do. about share a, what are the researchers. We about we that? have a long-standing interaction with the IU School of Medicine. We have because of the nature of our clinical program in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, we have a significant number of our faculty that are actually located full time in Indianapolis, particularly in Wishart Hospital. We have some in Riley Hospital, Methodist Hospital. And we have faculty that are jointly appointed at the um, IU School of Medicine and some of their faculty appointed in our School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. We also have a, a very significant collaboration with them in Kenya where we help provide care for AIDS patients in Kenya through the AMPATH program, which is the academic model uh, for the treatment and prevention of AIDS, or prevention and treatment of HIV AIDS. And we have students that go there for eight weeks at a time to get a clinical experience working in that very challenging environment because it's an under-resourced environment, right. trying to provide care for, for AIDS patients. And uh, that's been a wonderful collaboration with IU. We also have significant collaborations with them through our School of Health Sciences. We have two faculty in our School of Health Sciences whose focus research-wise is on imaging. And they actually do their research as part of the imaging center down at IU School of Medicine. So we have a number of collaborations in the area of teaching experientially, um, also in our research areas within both the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences and the School of Health Sciences. Yeah, it's, been, it's been a wonderful collaboration. Yeah, that's good. Um, the research support is that how is that the stat, is that increasing or for the government and for the for your research that's a challenge. Well, certainly, right at these moments, uh, <laughs> it's it's a challenge because right. government funding has become pretty flat. Uh, we've been successful to increase each year, uh, maybe not as much as we like, but we have been able to continue to increase our funding and and certainly extramural funding is critical to our program. Uh, just uh, rough numbers, about 40 percent of our budget comes from tuition and state appropriation and then we raise 60 percent of it through external sources. And a significant part of that is through sponsored research. And so that's a very important element of what we do. Right. And our research predominantly is funded by the National Institutes of Health, but we also have funding from the National Science Foundation and from industry, in particular the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about diversity, all mm -hmm. that, and, and the schools. In the colleges. Yeah, I, I think that certainly what you see in pharmacy, there's been a significant shift in terms of the gender population. Uh, right now, we are running generally between 60 and 70 percent of our student body in pharmacy is female. And so that's a shift from what it was, let's say, about 25 years ago. Um, and nursing continues to be predominantly women. Uh, it is a ch continues to be a challenge for all of the health professions to be able to recruit underrepresented students. I think we have a very successful program in not only recruiting students, but students being successful in our program in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences through our multicultural programs that, that is headed up by Jackie Jimerson, who directs mm -hmm. that for us. I, I think as those who train health professionals, we have a, a, a special responsibility when it comes to the area of diversity. We know from a variety of statistics there are tremendous health disparities that exist in this country today uh, between minority populations and non-minority populations, both in terms of access and care, um, the frequency of certain diseases, and the outcomes of those diseases. And, and it's simply something that needs to be addressed and therefore something that our students need to be sensitive to. And I think all of us uh, in the professions believe that increasing the training of underrepresented students in the health professions is one of the keys to helping address those health disparities. Sure, right. Now, I think your area of uh, medication errors, let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that, uh, your focus on that. I know you addressed it a little bit earlier. Sure. Was, yeah. Well, shortly after I came here, in fact, I think it was uh, the first Friday I was here, I had an opportunity to initiate a discussion with the Lilly Endowment uh, about the possibility of some new initiatives and a vision for the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. 
And that culminated in December of 2006 with a grant from the Lilly Endowment to support a series of initiatives that we proposed to them. And uh, that grant was for $25 million, a significant portion of which is focused on the area of medication safety and in a, in a discovery, a learning, and an engagement element of the area of medication safety. We believe this is a critical area that uh, is needed in our society today. Uh, the frequency of medication errors is significant. Uh, the impact is, is profound. Uh, we know, for example, that if, if you look at medical errors overall, about 100,000 patients die every year due to medical errors. That's more than the number of people die from breast cancer and automobile accidents combined. A significant portion of that is medication errors. And we believe that we really need to take a broad systems approach to trying to address that problem. So we're doing this in several ways. We have launched a, a new engagement initiative that we call PharmaTap. And what this is is we have an expert team of individuals who can do several things. First of all, they can go into an area, a hospital for example, where a medication error has occurred, and they can identify the cause and recommend both short and long-term solutions to try to prevent that medication error from occurring again. In addition, they can go in proactively and evaluate a system to try to identify weak links before a significant medication error occurs. And then third, they can go in and help develop ways of more effectively delivering pharmaceutical care in, in a hospital setting as well as in a community setting. And we've been involved in a number of initiatives with states to try to, with institutions within the state to try to do that. We are also developing a new model to try to engage pharmacists in the community in trying to detect, prevent, and manage adverse drug reactions. We know that every year about 700,000 people visit emergency rooms due to adverse drug reactions. That's an extremely expensive place to try to deliver care. And we believe that pharmacists are underutilized in, in that whole arena. And so we are developing a model that is can fit within the business model that pharmacies need to operate by, but can engage community pharmacists in this very important area of preventing and managing adverse drug reactions. In addition, we are launching a, a research initiative in the area of medication safety. In fact, we are, we're doing some faculty hiring specifically in that area. We've initiated a number of seed grants to try to launch new projects in the area of medication safety. Our ultimate goal is to have a system that's safe enough that a human error is not going to be translated into a patient tragedy. Yeah. Are human errors, do they look at in the home or are they primarily, are they looking at in the, in the healthcare facility itself? We, we are trying to look at it broadly. Right. And we believe this is, in the home is one area that has not been examined adequately. And part of that is it's just so difficult to collect that data. But as the complexity of medication, occur. oh, it, it, it does occur. We right. know it does. Uh, the number of people that are on five or more medications is fairly astounding, and it continues to grow. And when you develop very complex medication regimens, it's difficult for patients to remember what to take, when, how to take it, and, and accidents do happen. And so we are looking at ways of trying to be able to improve the safety of medication errors. And, and that's one of the uh, reasons that we're interested in working with Arcadia with their new system right. of being able to deliver. The daily med method has a way of improving the safety of home medication use. Right, it was sound. And also with the couple, sometimes the w one is taking it and the other isn't and then they can't uh, they don't comprehend why they can't remember, so this other would help a little bit. Well, what also is a problem today is we have many people who are caregivers for parents oh. in their homes. Um, I spoke with a woman who is in northwest Indiana, and she drives three hours each way every weekend to go and lay out her mother's medications for the week so that her mother will take the right medications at the right time. Of course, she's gone all week, and she doesn't know if her mother's really doing that, and she lives with that constant anxiety of whether or not her mother's getting the appropriate medical care, plus that burden of taking that trip every weekend to try simply to set up her mother's medications. And, and there are people all across our state that are living under that constant stress, and, and we believe that there's ways that we can intervene to help make home medication use much safer than right. it is today. And people are living longer, so therefore Most that definitely. just increases the, yes. the risk and whatever. Most right. definitely. Yeah. What is, uh, you might mention again some of the challenges that are facing healthcare. I know you've addressed some of them. Are there any others that come to mind? There, there are three key issues okay. in healthcare um, quality, cost, and access. 
Th those are the issues that have to be addressed, and they have to be addressed together. We have to make sure that we have the highest quality of medical care possible, but at a, core, a cost that doesn't bankrupt people, right. and, and yet one that allows access to the full spectrum of our population. Uh, and those are challenges for us as a nation, obviously. We haven't found the solution, and I don't think any nation has found the solution, but we certainly can do better than we are today. Right. And isn't and the cost is really a big thing because many people are uninsured. Well, we and have a large portion of people that are uninsured. Right. Uh, some of them because they can't afford it. Right. Some because they choose not to be. On, they right. they choose not to make that investment, um, playing the gamble that they're not going to get ill and need it. And so we certainly have a large number of uninsured people, which then places a significant burden on many of our hospitals, particularly in urban settings, right. because they're not going to turn these patients away. And so who absorbs the cost? Well, it's those people who are insured right. and the government that ends up absorbing those costs. That's right, exactly, yeah. Um, your school is doing the rankings, uh, mm -hmm. doing pretty well, second in the nation, is that the most Well, the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences is, is, is ranked between number two and number nine, depending on what ranking system you want to use. Uh, you know, different people use different ranking systems, <laughs> and we, we get ranked number two, number three, number five, or number nine, depending on which ranking system you want to use. Um, we're a top 10 school, and we think the difference between uh, number one through 10 is pretty small. Right. Uh, I think that uh, our desire is certainly to be one of the leading institutions, and uh, Purdue has been in that position in pharmacy for some time, and uh, we intend to keep it there. Right. Do your students, do you get many from in-state, or uh, what, how about the uh, uh, in-state and the national and international? How, how's the breakout? Sure. Yeah. Well, in terms of, for example, this fall's class that entered into the Doctor of Pharmacy program, mm -hmm. uh, over 75 percent of the students are Indiana residents. And then the rest are a mixture of out-of-state students, many of whom started here at Purdue as freshmen before they came into the pharmacy program. And then also international students who, again, started at Purdue and then entered into the pharmacy program. We don't accept students into our doctor pharmacy program directly from an international institution. Mm -hmm. They have to have done their pre-pharmacy work uh, here in the United States. I see. Uh, but some of them maybe have come here at the high school age or uh, came here as freshmen and therefore are classified as international students. They're not residents, uh, permanent residents of Indiana yet. What's the breakout as far as the grad students are concerned? Are they pro both U.S. and outside? There's a, we have a combination. Okay. It depends on the program. It's around 50-50 sure. between having U.S. students and international students. Right. Okay. And that's, that's fairly common in the pharmaceutical sciences across the country. In fact, we perhaps have a little bit higher of what we call domestic students, U.S. students, than a lot of other programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, giving back the support. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple comments on that. Sure. Oh, that's changed over time. <laughs> well, the, the impact of alumni on our program is huge, and alumni give back in several ways. Uh, alumni come and participate in a number of activities with our students just to be able to provide that short-term mentorship, to provide, provide those networking opportunities. We also have alumni that come back and participate in some of our courses, both didactic courses and laboratories, so they can talk about their career experience, their real life experience, and share that with students. We also bring alumni back uh, periodically to get their insight into the things that we need to be thinking of as a program. For example, as we evaluate our curriculum, we involve our alumni in that. Uh, because they are operating in a variety of different areas in healthcare and in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and then, of course, we depend upon them significantly for their generous donations. They're uh, very supportive. We could not do the things that we do without our alumni support. Um, this past year, for example, in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, I think we gave out about $750,000 in scholarship money. We couldn't have done that without the generous right. donations of alumni. Right. And so it's really critical. And we're just very grateful that we have a, a wonderful group of alumni who are, are very connected to our school and, and reach back and help those that are coming behind them. Right. Yes, I would say so. That's true. You got a couple of awards and honors. And you're a fellow of the American Association of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Mm -hmm. And that's very nice. Well, that, that is a nice award. I'll right. probably say, though, that the the awards that mean the most to me is I, I received the Teacher of the Year Award when I was at Wayne State University and at the University of Iowa. And uh, all of us who go into academia obviously have a love of teaching and being able to be recognized for that teaching is probably the most rewarding type of 
of recognition that you can receive. Do they come as a surprise or how to tell, tell us? I usually ask people that and sometimes it's a surprise and sometimes, well, I saw somebody dropped the ball, but it, it's nice, you know. Sure it was. The reaction well, think, of people. Yeah, you know? each teaching award was a surprise. I didn't right. know it was coming. Um, and so that was, it was, it was just a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, that's very good. Um, got a favorite Purdue tradition? I don't know that I've been here long enough to tell what's a tradition and what's a Johnny come lately. <laughs> Well, you could try the, the uh, Boilermaker <laughs> special. People sort of sometimes think, people forget that when you see it driving around, the tradition is you're supposed to honk. A lot of people don't honk, but I you do anyway. <laughs> well, I think certainly the world's biggest drum is, is my wife's <laughs> right. favorite tradition. She right. enjoys watching those at the at the football game and being able to, to see that wheel out and to watch the, the All-American band play. I think also at the end, when the, uh, the last game, when the seniors get to hit that, that really that is, is kind of good, and yeah, some of them really can go, yes. go at it great. Yeah, it looks like it's got a good sized dent in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, right. Oh, dear. Do you have an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to uh, share with us that comes to mind? Uh, professional? Um, or professional. whatever event. Well, I mean, certainly coming here to Purdue uh, was, was a very significant. It wasn't something that I would have anticipated if you had asked me. Uh, 10, 15 years sure. ago, I wouldn't have anticipated being in the position that I am today. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here at Purdue, and it's a, it's been an exciting time yes. for us. Any closing or some remarks for the researchers that you'd like to, um, or something that I didn't ask that you'd like to share? Um, nothing that really comes off the top. You've hit a pretty yeah. wide swath there. But it's, we're moving ahead, though. And oh, I think this is a time of tremendous opportunity. Right. It really is. Particularly um, with the new strategic plan in, in place. Well, and I just think in the world that we live in, um, right. things are certainly changing faster than they ever have, and that challenges people. Right. Um, academia is not used to moving real fast. and uh, But we live in a world today uh, that is changing rapidly, and we need to keep pace with it. And actually, if we want to be a leader, we need to be out in front. And that means that we need to be more aggressive, perhaps, than we have in the past. You know, one of the most significant changes, I think, is that the, the day of individual investigators being in the laboratory and just doing their own research um, is winding down. And most of the significant research is being done by larger groups. And it does require a change in culture. Uh, faculty willing to work more with one another to be able to be a part of something bigger rather than just keep a small part themselves. But it really provides us with an opportunity to answer the really significant questions. And that's what I would like us to focus on. Uh, we only have so much time, we only have so many resources. Right. And uh, Make the best use of it. Make the best use of it and focus where you can have a significant impact and really make a difference. Right, good. Thank you very much, Dean Clinton. I really appreciate that. This My pleasure. Very nice, thank you. My pleasure. <clears throat>